law. What you need to know for compliance for July 1st. My name is Julie Dora, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, with the remaining time available for your questions. If you have any questions, and we've got a lot of folks on today, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the uh, uh, question answer section. There's a, a little uh, box to the right where you just have to enter in your question and put it in there, and we'll hold it until the end. Um, earlier this morning, we also emailed you a link to a downloadable copy of our presentation. If you haven't received it, feel free to email me right now. And again, my email address is on the screen. Um, and I'll send that document to you right away. Before we get started, also note that this webinar and all of the accompanying materials are protected by copyright and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and does not constitute legal advice. We recommend that you consult with your legal counsel to address your specific situation, especially on topics like this. Let's get started today by welcoming our presenters. You know them well. First, we have Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda works with business owners and executives to provide strategic human resources direction develop leadership talent, and increase organizational effectiveness. We also have attorney Marla Mira Robinson. Marla's with the law firm Mira Robinson Jackson and Clarkson, where she's a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices in the areas of corporate, mergers and acquisitions, real estate, finance, and employment law. Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you to get started. I'm hoping you can make those slides sing today, because this is going to be a hot topic. Thanks, Julie, and welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we have the agenda up, and I don't need to read it to you. We're going to go through, hopefully, everything you ever want to know about this law. What I am going to tell you, though, is Marla and I have been talking about this along with Julie, and it's almost like we should have a game show, you know, how to frustrate California employers one more way, because this is one of the most poorly written laws we've seen in a long time when it comes to employment. And so there are a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of areas of this law where it's just silent on an issue. So I know we've both been fielding questions from clients um, for the last several weeks, and I'm sure you'll have your questions today. We're going to tell you right now there's a lot of things we don't know about this law. There's a lot of areas where it's just not addressed. So we're going to try to point those out to you, and we're also going to give you our best advice in terms of how to comply. But we feel your pain. We're right there with you. So let's get started and go through some of these different issues, and uh, we'll do our best to answer all the questions that you have um, when it comes to this law. Okay, on the, the first page, and Julie, here we go again. For some reason, it's not letting me move slides. Oh, there we go. Um, on the first page, let's talk about eligibility. So this page sick leave applies to all employees in California who've worked 30 or more days within a year. So it does include your part-time people, your seasonal people, your temporary people. doesn't matter how you pay them. If it's per diem, salary, hourly, does not matter. Anyone who's working 30 or more days within a year is covered by this law. Now, here's our first issue. Day is not defined in the law. So if somebody is working one hour a day, we're believing it counts toward that 30-day minimum. So some of you have what I'll call sporadic employees. Like I've got a client in Los Angeles, they have people that um, might do a couple hours of work you know, while they're going to school. They might log into the system, do a couple hours of work, not work for the next three weeks, work a couple hours the next week, and so forth. If they're working 30 more days, they're going to be covered by this law. Now, there are a few exceptions, and you can see those listed below. So if you have employees that are covered by a collective bargaining agreement that already provides six days, then they're not covered here. Same with in-home support services employees, although I will tell you, if anybody on this call is in that industry, um, there are laws pending right now that would include them in the next go-around. And then finally, the airline flight deck or cabin crew members do have equivalent benefits. So unless you're playing in one of those different arenas or under those exceptions, all of your employees are going to be covered on this law. Okay, let's talk about accrual. Um, the, the law sets forth initially that the way to do this is accrual. Now, I'm going to tell you in a little bit that we're against the accrual for the most part. I'm also going to tell you that there's alternatives and how you meet the benefit. But essentially the benefit is that you need to provide your employees with at least one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours they work. So again, here's a legislature that puts together a law. I think they probably chose 30 hours to tie it back to 
um, the ACA, but most of our employees are probably working 40 hours. And so, again, we have this really funky accrual situation. Um, if employees are working 40 hours a week, and that's 1.33 hours per week they have to accrue, and if they're salaried exempt employees, so it doesn't matter if they're working, you know, how many hours, right, one to 100, and um, they get to pay the same amount, those are in the law deemed to work 40 hours per week. Okay, so the law is clear on that. Now, part-time employees, the one way we have discovered that um, payroll systems can, can address this is to think of it in terms of how many sick hours per hour of work. So the law says one hour for every 30 hours of work, but again, if you have a situation like I mentioned before where you have two people working, or you have somebody working two hours this week, not next week, three hours the next week, it may take them several pay periods to hit 30 hours and get granted that one hour of paid sick leave. So the best advice we can give you on that is to set them up with .033 sick hours per hour of work. That's an accrual that your payroll system should be able to accommodate. Um, so talk to your payroll provider about that and see what they can do. Um, the accrual, if you're on an accrual basis, it must be rolled over to the next year. And I'm going to talk in a second about the lump sum grant, um, which does not have to be rolled over. So you can cap the accrual at 48 hours or six, six days, whichever is greater, and you have to put that in your written policy. So just remember that as well. Now, I mentioned before, we're going to recommend against the accrual unless someone's working really sporadically. On the accrual, um, is basically your break even is at 720 hours. So you have to give one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours of work. Right? Or you have to give 24 hours um, a year. I'm going to move to the next slide now. Where it can cost up the full grant. 24 hours or three days, whichever is greater. So when you're evaluating how do we want to do this, we want to do a lump sum grant. We want to do um, the accrual. Think about it this way, in, in our opinion. First of all, the accrual is sort of a pain to track, especially if you have people working just periodically or part-time. If you can get a if you can go with the 24 hours or three days, okay, we think that's probably in your best interest. If you can't do that and you have to do a cruel, then that's what you're going to have to do. But if they're going to be working more than 720 hours across the course of the year, then go with lump sum grants because they're going to hit that accrual. Here's the problem with the accrual in addition to just the administration. The accrual cannot be stopped. Like you don't have them accrue up to 24 hours and go, okay, you're good. Okay, that's not how the law is written. The accrual has to continue. You can restrict their usage, which I'll talk about, but you can't restrict the, the accrual. So the problem is you're going to be showing your employees, oh, look, if you work full time, it's something, something like um, eight hours or eight days rather a year that they're going to accrue, but you're going to say, oh, no, you can't use it. That's going to be really confusing to employees. So that's just one of the many reasons we're going to recommend you go with this full grant if at all possible. So the alternative to accrual is you grant 24 hours to three days. You need to think of that as whichever is greater. Again, it doesn't specifically say that in the law, but some of the um, DLSC FAQs that are out on their website um, imply that that's how they're interpreting it. So if somebody is working part-time, let's say they work six hours a day, they're going to get more than three days because you know it's going to take them four days to hit 24 hours. If you have somebody that's working 10 hour days, like a 440 work week, you need to be granting them 30 hours because that would be the greater of three days or 24 hours. So hopefully that is clear, at least clear as much. So if you're going to do a lump sum grant, you need to grant the full amount of leave at the beginning of each year. So right now, for example, let's say you want to do a grant um, July 1st, but ultimately you want everything to be on a calendar year basis. I have many clients who are doing it that way. You still need to grant them the full 24 hours or three days right now. You can wipe it out at the end of the year and then start them again with a full lump sum grant on January 1st if that's what you want to do. Okay, so we'll go back to some examples of that later. And again, if I'm not being clear, then just ask the question and happy to help you with that. Okay, another alternative to the accrual is to have a PTO policy, a paid time off policy. As long as your paid time off can be used for sick and for the same purposes as this law includes. Um, it's in writing. Just know that you can use PTO to provide the same benefit. Okay? It has to be, again, 
at least 24 hours or three days have to be able to be used for the same purpose as sick pay, right? The only really downside to this that you're going to give additional time is that paid sick leave does not have to be paid out upon termination, but once it gets, it gets combined with your PTO, you're going to have to pay out PTO upon a separation, okay? Here's one other little weird rule that, again, it's not super clear on the law, but how we are interpreting it right now is you have to pay out PTO upon separation, but there's another part of the law that says if somebody is rehired within one year, any unused hours have to be reinstated. Our best guess right now is this will get cleaned up, so our best guess right now is that you could be in a situation if you rehire somebody where you paid them out those hours, but then you have to turn around and put them back on the books if you rehire them. So one way to avoid that, obviously, is not to rehire anybody, but just know that going in that that's one of the other downsides um, to using PTO. Now, another alternative to the accrual is to have unlimited sick time. This is actually becoming um, a growing, you know, popular policy out there that I see, especially with respect to your salary exempt employees. So, so like what I do with my recruiting manager, for example, is I don't tell her how many sick days to get. She gets PTO and she can use it for whatever she wants to. But I could just say to her, look, you have unlimited sick time. If you're sick, take it, whatever you need, okay? I have to be able to manage that in terms of attendance, right? So think about it from a management standpoint. But I can have a policy with her that just says, hey, you have as much sick time as you need for yourself or your daughter, okay? Now, the one thing about the unlimited sick time is you still have the same reporting requirements. So it's still you still have to, and I'm going to go through those in a second, you still have to be giving your employee a statement that says what their available time is. There is a law out there that's um, been proposed that would allow you just to put the word unlimited there. Um, but right now, again, the law is silent on that. And you also must still track usage. So even though it's unlimited, I have to keep track of when she's going to be out sick. Okay, so a couple, Julie, just, just yeah. real quickly, we're having a couple issues with the audio, and I don't know if you're you're moving around away from the microphone, but it's getting it fades in and then out, so it gets a little quiet sometimes, oh. and we can't hear. So if you could just stay focused in front of the microphone, so we can hear better. Okay, well, I will take it off the speaker and see if this helps. I haven't moved at all, but I will take it off the speaker. And okay, it, will help. it just sounds like you're going in and out a little bit. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I, that's we fine. Had a couple of all right. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Okay. So here are a couple of other um, issues. The first one is you can define the year in different ways. So when I talked about the grant or the accrual, when I say 24 hours or three days, whichever is greater over the course of the year, you can do it any way you want to. You can tie it to the employee's hire date. You can go July 1 to June 30th date, which for a lot of clients that are going to be granting sick pay for the first time, that's going to that's going to be their year, right? For anybody that's here right now, um, it can be a calendar year. As I said a second ago, you can, you know, start accrual right now, and then Jan one you can wipe out that accrual and give a lump sum grant if that's what you want to do. But you can change it as long as you're meeting the requirements under the law. Um, what you don't want to do is prorate the grant if you're changing. So, for example, um, if an employee gets hired September first, you need to grant all 24 hours on September first. Now, you can wipe those out if they're still on the books at the end of the year and turn around and give them another grant on January 1st and then use that date going forward. That's fine, but you don't want to prorate it on September 1st. You don't want to say, well, you know, we're three quarters of the way through the year, so I'm just going to give them six hours right now and then 24 on January 1st. I originally thought that that was a possibility, but since then I, I have uh, learned that that is not what the, uh, the law has in mind for that. You also can use different methods for different groups or have different levels of benefit for different groups. So you could have, for example, 24 hours for your non-exempt and unlimited for your salary exempt. You could do a pool with your part-time people and do a lump sum grant with your full-time people. So any way you want to do it as long as you're meeting the burden and, of course, it's not done on a discriminatory basis and you should be fine with that. Okay, let's talk about usage. Um, the usage, the one sort of strange thing about this law is it says you have, they must be able to begin using it no later than the 90th day of employment. It does not say the first after 90 days. So for those of you that are going to write a policy, 
we're so used to saying your benefits kick in the first after something, just note that this law says on the 90th day of employment, okay? So you want to make sure that what you're writing is consistent with that. And um, you can limit the use of sick pay to the 24 hours or three days, um, whichever is greater. So again, I'm going to give you a couple of things that have come up. If somebody is, um, if somebody is working a 440 work week, they're working for 10 hour days, your grant is going to be 30 hours instead of 24. They have the right to say how much time they want to use. If they're out six for 10 hours that day and they have six hours in their bucket, they can take six hours. You don't have to advance any time for them. If they have 12 hours in their bucket, they can say, I want to take 10 hours. That's fine. Okay, so they're, it's up to them for how they want to use their sick pay. Um, so it has to be provided upon their oral or written request. Certainly, most of us would, re would request for them to put it in writing, but it has to be provided upon their oral request. Um, you can require some advanced certification if it's foreseeable. If it's not foreseeable, then it says as soon as practical. It doesn't define either one of those, of course. Um, a couple other things to note is that if, if you have employees in place right now, that let's say they started working for you at the end of last year, they have, are deemed to have already satisfied the 90-day um, wait. And so just know that as soon as you start giving them, um, you're not going to make them sit through that wait again. Okay. The usage can be for themselves. It could be for a family member. And there's a long definition of family member that's in the law. So of course, go through the usual things. A child could be um, a biological child, adopted child, you know, anything like that. It could be for um, a legal guardian, it could be a spouse, registered domestic partner, grandparent, grandchild. So it's very specific in the law about family member. It can be for their diagnosis care or it could be preventative in nature. So going to the doctor for your annual physical, for example. And also under domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking laws, um, there are rules around allowing people to use sick time to attend to their needs under those laws. You can set a minimum, a reasonable minimum requirement or increment, but it cannot exceed two hours. But it has to be consistent with whatever else you do. So if you allow, for example, vacation pay to be taken in 15-minute increments, just match that for your sick pay. Um, so you can go ahead and say they can take it in two hours. You cannot say you have to use sick leave in four hours. Okay? And then, again, I'm going to keep saying this, provide the greater of 24 hours or three days, um, whichever is the higher standard for you. Okay, um, let's talk about rate of pay. This is one of the more confusing areas um, because, of course, government couldn't have made it easy on anybody, and so the rate of pay is the employee's current base rate, right? So you're paying somebody 10 bucks an hour, they're out sick, you're going to pay them 10 bucks an hour, except here are some of the exceptions. If the employee had more than one base rate during the past 90 days, let's say they got a raise, um, let's say they have two different rates of pay well, for whatever reason, then it's a different calculation. If they get commission, um, if they are paid piece rate, if their salary is not exempt and worked overtime, if there's anything other than just one straight hourly rate, it's a different calculation. And the calculation is essentially this. You take all of the compensation except for premium overtime pay, or the overtime premium pay, I should say, for the previous 90 days, and then you divide by the number of hours of work to establish the base rate. So let me go through a few examples to give you an idea, and hopefully you have this in your handout so you can refer back to it. So let's say you have an employee um, who was paid a piece rate, right? They're doing installation of something, carpet or whatever. So 36 cents per square foot, right? Or actually 3.6 cents per square foot for 16,500 square feet during the period. Okay? He was 400 hours during that 90 days. And that was his total earnings of 5,940. You would take total earnings, divide by the 400, and that comes out to $14.85 per hour. That is the rate of pay you would use to pay him for that sick day. Take another example. Let's say somebody is paid commission only. She worked 480 hours, she earned $9,000. You take the 480 hours, divide it into 9,000, it comes out to the 1875. There you have it. Make one more example a little bit more complicated with some overtime. Let's say the employee works 45 hours each week for 13 weeks during that 90-day period, got a raise after five weeks, right? So for five weeks, he was making $10 an hour. 
and you're going to calculate it out and say, okay, that person made $22.50. For the other eight weeks, the person was making $11.50, so you're going to calculate that out. She also got some commission. You're going to add that in. Take all of that together. So those are the total hours. Now, remember, we're not including the overtime premium pay, but for those extra five hours, you're going to calculate in the $10 an hour or the $11.50 an hour. That's why it's just a straight math calculation. You total it up, divide by the total hours worked over that time period, in this case, $12.46 an hour, and that's going to be what you're going to end up paying that employee. Okay, um, let's talk one more thing, and I'm going to turn it over to Marla and let her talk about some of the uh, penalties and the record-keeping notices um, that you're required to do already, actually, and she'll go through those with you. The last thing is on separation. You're not required to pay out any unused six hours at the time of separation unless your hours are included as part of the PPO plan. Once you combine it with vacation, you have to comply with the select test decision, which means you have to pay it out upon termination. So if you keep it separate, it just goes away and you'll pay out vacation. If you combine the two, you're paying it out in total. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if the employee is rehired with one year, then any previously accrued and unused paid sick days must be reinstated. And the law seems to suggest and must be reinstated even if you've already paid for them. You can't say, well, I paid it out, so they go away. Hopefully that gets clarified as, as time goes on, but right now that's how we're interpreting the law. All right, so hopefully that gives you some basics, and I'm going to turn it over to Marla. Thank you, Linda. And I, I, I feel like I should apologize to the group, although I wasn't the one who wrote this law. <laughs> Most of the legislatures are, are attorneys. To just reiterate what Linda said, it is one of the most poorly written laws. It, but the name of it, by the way, is the Healthy Workplaces, Healthy Families Act of 2014. And it can be found at Labor Code 245 through 249. It's not very lengthy, so I do recommend you, you pick it up and read it. It'll give you an example of how poorly written it is. Just a quick example, um, it, it, the law states that it, it applies to any employee who, after July 1, 2015, works in California for 30 or more days within a year. Okay, it doesn't say works for you as an employee. It's employer, excuse me. It says works in California for 30 or more days within a year. Now, while I don't think that was the intent that it, it applies, that we're supposed to ask them, have you been working in California for more than 30? I think it should only apply for that particular employer. That's not what it says. So an argument could be made. I think we're going to see a lot of changes coming out to clarify this, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So first, your record keeping and notices requirements. You must keep records for three years, documenting the hours worked and the paid sick days accrued and used. You've got record keeping requirements like this already, but this is specifically called out in the statute and also that it must be made available to labor commissioner and employees upon request. Again, that's the current obligation. If they drop in and ask for these things, you must provide them, but it's specifically called out in the statute. Since January of this year, January 1st of this year, you have been required to post a poster. If you haven't done so already, here is a link for the poster. You can download it, print it, and go ahead and post it where you post your other employment posters. And we'll talk about penalties later because the penalties are all cumulative and, and have to do with other um, requirements as well. Other notices, you must provide all employees with individual notice of the sick policy, also in the statute. In addition, you may recall that the Wage Theft Prevention Act, which is California Labor Code Section 2810.5, requires you as employers to provide all non-exempt employees with amended wage theft notices when they're hired or within seven days of change to the info on the notice. So th this is this download link here that I've provided you will, pr will satisfy both of those. It's not mandatory that you use this form, but you can and then satisfy both obligations. I've got a little portion of the form on the next slide, and if you look down uh, at the, the four alternatives, it says the following applies to the employee identified on this notice. This portion applies to the paid sick leave. If you use option one, you are providing the minimum and using the accrual method. And Linda's given you the pros and cons of doing that. Like Linda, our firm is highly, strongly, <laughs> emphatically re recommending do not use that accrual method unless you absolutely have to, um, to minimize your dollar exposure because your exposure for penalties and interest, as we'll talk about later, is higher 
uh, for making mistakes without accrual method, which there's so many uh, uh, ways to do that, um, and also that carrying over and mixing it with PTO, I think, is the worst thing you can do, um, having to pay it out and then having that risk of having to reinstate. So um, you only check item one, or box, excuse me, box one, if you're using the option to provide the minimum and using the accrual method. You would check box two if you're accruing sick time and providing greater than 24 hours. Um, that, again, that's you're providing more than the minimum. You use uh, box three if you're granting a lump sum, which is what we recommend at the beginning of the year, and for those, uh, for everyone for that haven't done hasn't done it already, um, for July 1st of this year. And I say for those of you who haven't done it already, um, I have many employers who already, as of January of this year, granted three days because that's been their practice for a long time. It had nothing to do with the laws. They, they already had three, four, five paid sick days. And to Linda's point, some of them unlimited with some employees. But you would check box three if you're granting a lump sum um, amount of the 24 hours or the three days or more at the beginning of the year. And you would check box four if, if you are exempt from the law. And Linda went over those that are exempt. I think there's one more that maybe she didn't mention. I don't recall that. that air carriers that are subject to the Railway Labor Act. Additional notices, you must provide written notice that sets forth the amount of sick leave available on the itemized wage statement or in a separate notice provided on the employee's pay date. Now, I, the only time I can imagine you would want to do it on a separate notice is if you're wanting to do maybe on an online service through you know, some of your HR modules. Um, but you need to check your pay stubs for compliance. You need to talk to your payroll companies about what they've put in place to address this law, and especially if you're doing the accrual, and to sure, ensure that your, your paycheck stubs are, are compliant. We are seeing so many lawsuits um, regarding paycheck stub um, uh, violations, not with this, obviously, because this is new and hasn't started yet, but with others, and I, I just know that this is going to get added. So if you have any kind of wage and hour complaint, you're going to be sure to see paycheck stub violations on top of that. So the law also protects um, employees from retaliation, not surprisingly, um, as many of these employee um, favored laws do. Uh, it protects employees who use the sick leave, who file a complaint with the labor commissioner, who allege violations of the rights, who cooperate in investigations or prosecutions, or who oppose a policy or practice that's prohibited by the statute. Not uh, much different than what we see with our other protections. It prohibits an employer from denying the employee the right to use the paid sick leave, discharging or threatening to discharge, demoting or suspending, or in any manner discriminating against an employee. If the employer engages in any of those activities, there is a rebuttable presumption of unlawful retaliation. And um, if it's done within 30 days of the employee's request for leave or other protected activity. And then the employer would be um, allowed to rebut, but that presumption would be there. And then the burden shifts to the employer to say, no, this isn't what, why we did this. We took this action for another reason, another non-discriminatory, non-violation of the statute reason. So let's talk about the penalties. Just one more area to have potential penalties against employers. If you fail to post, it's $100 per offense for willfully violating the posting requirement. Generally, willfully violating just means you didn't do it once it became law. It's not, I, I didn't know, it's not a, it's a, not a defense. Um, if you fail to um, withhold and pay the sick day, if you withhold the sick days and fail to pay, the employee is entitled to the dollar equivalent of days with, um, multiplied times three um, or $250, whichever is greater, uh, not to exceed an aggregate penalty of 4000 And I'm looking and seeing that we're not on the right slide. I've been going along without. We should be on the slide titled penalties. There we go. OK. So. Um, if the paid sick days aren't withheld, the employee are, are withheld and not paid, the employee is entitled to the dollar equivalent of the days withheld times three or $250, whichever is greater, not to exceed an aggregate penalty of 4000 There are other violations of penalties, for example, failure to provide the written notice to the employee, um, penalty of $50 a day, not to exceed an aggregate penalty of $4,000. Um, and this is $50 a day 
for every day that the violation is occurring. That's why it's an aggregate potential of 4,000. And the Labor Commissioner may impose penalties of $50 a day to compensate the state for investigating and remedying violations with no limit. And again, that's $50 a day while the violation is occurring. However, in addition to all that, the Labor Commissioner, after a hearing, can um, order any appropriate relief. And I, I underscore the word any, including reinstatement if the employee has been terminated, back pay, the payment of the sick days, uh, clearly, the payment of the additional, and the, the additional sum as identified above in the form of an administrative penalty. All of these penalties are plus interest. All of these penalties are um, cumulative, meaning not, it's not just one penalty that applies, they all add together. In addition, the Labor Commissioner can bring a civil action in Superior Court to enforce any of these things and also uh, impose any of these penalties, as can the um, Attorney General. The Attorney General can do this as well. Now, whether or not the, this, these claims can be brought under a PAGA suit, um, the Personal Attorney General Act, um, we don't know. It, it's not clear in the statute. It, the, de the de statute does provide that the employer will not be assessed a penalty or the liquidated damages due to an isolated or unintentional payroll error. So if it's a clerical error or an inadvertent mistake, the penalties won't apply. Now, local ordinances. There are some ordinances that um, provide even greater protections to the employees. Um, San Francisco always, <laughs> if you have employees in San Francisco, always check for other local ordinances, not just with respect to um, paid sick leave, but any wage and hour, um, because they often have more protections for employees. But here it provides for up to, up to 72 hours. You need to look for your specific um, requirements depending on the size of the employer, and this has been since 2007. This says Emeryville, but I know that Oakland also provides an expanded definition of family. San Diego's is actually on hold um, pending a referendum that's for the voters that's going to be um, voted on sometime in July, but if it stands, it will provide up to 40 hours of sick leave. So if you have employees in other states or even in other cities, always check. There are also in LA, um, uh, sick leave pay for certain hotel workers and in Long Beach. Uh, I believe in, in LA it's 12 days and in, in Long Beach it's five days, but you should check, always check, have your attorney check for you for local ordinances. So our recommendations, first decide whether to accrue, uh, to accrue the sick leave or, or grant a lump sum. Uh, again, you, well, you'll hear us pound at home only because we don't have a lot of clarity in this law yet. And we're recommending the lump sum grant because that does provide some specificity and clarity. Um, write and issue a sick leave policy. Should get into your handbook. Every one of you probably has a handbook that is contrary to this law, unless you've been granting um, paid sick leave in a lump sum already every year. So you need to go back and take a look at that in addition to the notices we were discussing. Do not loan or advance um, sick pay because you can't deduct it from a, a final paycheck. Um, you certainly can loan or advance it, just know that you can't deduct it, which is why you shouldn't. Um, re remember that you can always let an employee have time off without pay um, for, for sick. We certainly don't want sick people coming to work. Uh, make sure your poster is up. Make sure all your non-exempt employees are issued the wage theft notice. Uh, that form we gave you the link to. Make sure paycheck stubs or other written notice says provide statements of available sick time. Again best not to have an additional form if you don't have to, so you should try to get it on your paycheck stub. Call Linda or me if you need any help. Know, as we, I suggested earlier, that there are bills that have been introduced that will revise the law or clarify the law. Um, this law, again, is so poorly written, it could be attacked and interpreted by um, attorneys in many, many different ways. There's currently three bills that I'm aware of for those of you who like to follow the laws, um, AB 304 four seeks clarification on some of the accruals. AB 11 um, adds uh, coverage to in-home service providers, which are right now excluded from the law. And SB 579, which expands the use of the time off for certain school-related activities um, for the employee's children. So watch those. Um, certainly Linda and I will put alerts out, and if any of those get adopted, we'll, we'll add them to later webinars. 
um, as well as our newsletters on, on changes in the law. And with that, I will turn it over to Julie for questions and answers. Well, thank you very much, Marla. And Linda, this has been a, kind of an eye-opening experience for me personally, just looking at this and thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to calculate all this stuff? So we certainly appreciate you helping us to be compliant on sick paid leave, especially since the deadline's right around the corner. That does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. And now we'd like to spend the remaining time answering your questions. We've got about 20, a little over 20 minutes. We've got a lot of people on today, and we received many questions earlier, of which we thought much of that was answered, as well as some that were maybe too specific that we we're going to handle offline. So at this particular point in time, you can submit your question in that box over on the right-hand side, typically on the right-hand side, in your dashboard um, for questions. You just type your question in at the bottom, hit return, and we'll read it aloud for uh, either Linda or Marla to answer. Also, Linda has been kind to answer some of the questions because we anticipated quite a few. So she's been answering some of your questions all along today, too. So we'll start here with a question from Cindy. Um, on July 1, do employees start accruing, or do we, or do we give them 24 hours, or is it our choice? Totally your choice. So as long as you're, again, I'm assuming 24 hours is, is the greater of 24 hours or three days. I'm going to keep pointing that out. But yeah, totally your choice. You can start them out on accrual and you can leave them on that. And every, you know, just for keep going and keep going and keep going. Every single month you're going to add more hours. Just know that you have to roll that over to up to six um, days or 48 hours. So there are some additional burdens with the accrual that you don't have with the lump sum grant, and that's why Marla and I keep saying, if you can do the lump sum grant, we think you're better off doing it that way. Okay, I agree. Good. I would just add, if you're going to do the July, um, if you haven't already granted any sick leave at all, and you're going to do the, the lump sum grant, which most of our clients are doing on July 1st if they haven't already, then you let them know this is a lump sum grant that will also be a lump sum grant, as Linda pointed out in her slides, on July 1, or excuse me, January 1 of next year. But this, this particular grant will expire on December 31st of this year. Okay. Right. You don't have to do that, though. I mean, you can just keep it July 1 every single year. But exactly. if you want to get them on a calendar year, that's what Mara was talking about. If you want to get my calendar year, just let them know it's going to expire at the end of the year, and you'll get a new grant. Because I've got some clients that are doing five days. Um, you know, for full-time people, but maybe they have a longer waiting period or something like that. So to be compliant with this law, they're going to do 24 hours July 1, and then they'll put them on the regular policy beginning January 1, which is what they've constantly done for their long-term employees. Okay, good. Um, Angel has a question. If we have taken the position to only allow employees to use 24 hours of paid sick leave within the year, does it present a problem to require a doctor's note for any subsequent absences related to the illness? Go ahead, Marla. <laughs> well, you, it, this law is very clear on the minimum, the 24 or the three days, that you cannot ask for a doctor's note. So I think beyond that, yes, you, you can ask for a doctor's note. But for, for the minimum that's required here, and again, just to jump on, on Linda's comment, where she keeps restating the minimum of the greater of 24 hours or three days. The statute doesn't actually say that, the greater of, but that's the interpretation by the DLSE and by most lawyers because why would you have the two? Why would you have 24 hours or three days if there wasn't a difference? And there clearly is a difference for three days if you're on a 10-hour workday. You don't have 24 hours, you have 30. So um, it, the statute is clear that you do not have the right for this minimum that is required to ask for a doctor's cer um, certificate or a doctor's note. For anything beyond that, yes. And I, but however, I would caution you to put it in your employee handbook and your written, or however you have your written policies, and give advance notice to the employees that that's what ex what is expected. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, Cindy, another question. Do current employees have to wait 90 days to use sick leave since they're all, they've already worked 90 days, they're current employees? Right. That's, that's what the DLSC has said, if they've already satisfied that requirement after January 1st. When te see, technically the law went into effect January 1st of this year. The only requirement so far had to do with the posting and the notices. Um, the actual granting of time does not come into play 
until July 1st. But if they have already worked for 90 days, um, then they don't have to re-establish that or however you want to say, they don't have to um, meet a, an additional 90-day waiting period. Okay, great. Um, and some of you have commented that the link on slide 19 that links to the poster is actually not working. Um, I just checked it right now. It does, the, the link actually is the correct link. We just must not have it linked correctly. So if you want to just, you know, copy and paste it and stick it in your browser, it should work for you okay. Um, let's see here. We've got Lisa. Um, we have a five-day grant at the top of the year. So we're in compliance, but then by July 1st, for the salesperson who is paid based in commission, I have to cal calculate her sick leave paid based on all compensation earned within the last 90 days of the sick days she takes. Let me reread that. Do I have to calculate her sick pay, sick leave pay based on all compensation earned within the last 90 days of the sick pay she takes? Yes. I'm understanding. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if I understand the question. And if I don't, email me. If I'm not answering it, email me and, and uh, we'll take it offline. But yes, so you're going to take all monies earned over the past 90 days with the one exception of not the overtime premium pay. And again, look, I'll be honest with you. If you guys are paying overtime and it's easier just to do the calculation, take all that stuff, you're going to be paying a greater amount if you factor that in. So if that's the easier calculation, don't worry about it the few dollars that it's going to be for the overtime premium pay, it's not going to be a lot, and you're going to be paying a higher amount. But take all monies paid over the last 90 days leading up to the day the person was absent, divided by the total number of hours worked, and that's the rate of pay. So if the person's been out for a day and they're working, we'll say, you know, regular, you know, um, five, eight-hour days a week, it's going to be that hourly amount times eight hours for their paid sick day. And okay. I would add that there doesn't seem to be any prohibition of saying we'll give you three granted um, paid leave days, 24 hours or three days, um, pursuant to the new statute. And your other two granted days are going to be paid as follows. Um, you know, your base pay without your commissions. Or oh, so that's a good point, that yeah. There doesn't seem okay. to be any prohibition against that. It may change. Oh, but everybody's head explode, and good luck explaining that to your employees and in a written document. Though. <laughs> well, and that, and you know that's a that's a good point. Again, you keep hearing me say over and over, and Linda as well about the grant of the three days. We try to make everything that you're doing as simple as possible because the minute you add these additional accruals or these changes in the different rates of pay for different types, uh, for the same type of um, leave, it's wrought with error. And, and, and the potential for landmines and mistakes that create all these penalties, which you can see are, are potentially huge. Yeah. Hey, Marla. Um, Marla, let me ask you a yeah. question. Somebody, somebody said that they've been told by somebody else that existing staff does have to resatisfy the 90 days um, waiting period. Did I, am I wrong on that? Do they have to re, if they, have already worked this year from January 1st, 90 days, um, do they have to re-satisfy the 90-day wait? No, that no. Be if, you, no. Right, no. If you've already worked 90 days, you've already worked 90 days. You okay. just have to have worked 30 days or more <laughs> within a year in California. Right. Okay. Just want to make okay. sure. So Cindy, who's posted that, uh, I would redirect you to the DLSU website because that's where you know, they have a whole list of FAQs on there, um, and that, I know that's one of them, so maybe I misstated it, but I'm pretty sure that they do have to, uh, they don't have to re-wait 90 days if they've been employed 90 days as of July 1st. Okay, good. Um, Linda has a question, can we require sick time be used if they call in sick but want to save the sick time? Uh, the law? as far as I know, does not allow um, the employer to mandate it. But Marla, what's your ruling on that? I don't understand the question. They, they call can, it sick, can but you they don't force want the employee, can, you, can the employer require the employee to use the sick pay? Oh, good. That's an excellent question, because this is an example of the poorly written law. It's silent. Because hmm. all, all I can point to is on the DLSU website, it says that the employee has a choice as to how many hours. 
Okay. Okay. Well, that might flesh itself out later this year. Um, Christy, <laughs> well, and, and here, well, let me tell you tell you where that's coming from, in case anybody wants to look at the statute, because the statute says that the employee may use, may determine how much paid sick leave he or she needs to use. Mm -hmm. Except that you know the employer, that's where the employer can set the increment, where it's going to be something between zero and two hours. Um, but that doesn't say that the there's nothing in the statute that says the employer can um, force the employee if they're taking sick leave to or six six times, excuse me, to take the sick leave. Now, of course, if they don't, and there's more sick leave, more sick time taken, more sick time taken, there's always discipline procedures that can be used. Right. Okay. Okay. All right, and Christy's wondering, how are salaried, exempt employees handled? Yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by handled. So they're going to work eight hours a day for the purpose of the accrual or lump sum grant and for the usage. So if somebody's out a full day, it's eight hours. That's how um, the DLC is defining salaried exempt, is they work eight hours a day. So it doesn't matter if they're really working 10 hours a day or not. They're working eight hours a day. You give them the 24 hours. Um, in terms of how much you're paying them, you're just paying them the day's rate. I mean, unless again, they're getting something in addition. If um, you know, if they're getting commission or whatever, I mean, you have to take the 90 days of wages, divide by the number of hours, but you're going to assume that they're working eight hours a day. Okay. Okay. Yeah, very rarely that it even applies to. Your exempt employees, because if they're working, you know, an hour or two of the week, they're getting paid for the week. So it only applies if they're taking more than a week off. Um, most of my clients, we have unlimited for for exempt, because if it, if uh, absence is an issue with an exempt employee, there's probably other issues. Okay. All right. Um, Enrique has a bit of an administrative kind of question here. What do we do with new employees who potentially start in late fall and probably would not accrue enough time if we went on our accrual system, and he says we won't, but don't want to give grants that can be perceived as inequitable? I imagine we could do a partial grant. You know, yes, no? Nope. Unfortunately, no. That's what I thought, too, because I thought, oh, this makes perfect sense. We'll just prorate it knowing that of you know, then like on January one, let's say, um, you give them the full grant, oh, they're gonna have over the course of that year enough time. Unfortunately DLSC has a uh, a question right on that and so you have to do the full grant if you're gonna go that way. So it may be perceived as in as an inequity to your existing employees if they got, you know, twenty four hours on Jan one and this person got twenty four hours on October one, but unfortunately that's what you have to do. You can wipe it out at the end of the year if everybody else is getting their end on Jan one. So you could give them the 24 hours, hope they don't use it, you know, October, November, December, take it out of their bank and then give them their new grant on January 1st. You can do that. You could also put them on a, an accrual basis for those three months, to stay with my example, from October 1st to the end of the year, and then change them over January 1st to a lump sum grant to be consistent with the rest of your employees. That's another way. Okay. All right, good. Um, Judy's wondering, regarding the required 30 days work, since it doesn't specify with employers, should we not require that 30-day period? That's a great question, and it depends on how conservative you want to be with the risk. If you don't want any risk, then you don't require the 30-day period. You just get through the 90-day period. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it, it's just poorly written. It doesn't say 30 days with the employer currently employed. It says an employee who works in California for 30 or more days okay. is entitled to it. But again, then you have to have worked for 90 days okay. before so, you can use it. So I, I would completely ignore the 30 days and just work, concentrate on the 90 days. Okay. Okay, good. Um, Lisbeth has construction field employees and then office staff, and she's wondering, you know, the construction field employees, can we define them as accrual and the office staff be defined as full 24 hours, three days? Absolutely. And that's one of those examples where, Lisbeth, you might actually definitely want to consider doing that, especially knowing your, your company. They're not necessarily going to be consistently working, right? So they're working on a project and they come to an end. 
you have to look at it. If you think that they're going to be working more than 720 hours during the course of the year, right, then the lump sum grant is going to be a better way to go. Okay, that's your break-even point. If they're going to be working less than that or you don't know, then put them on an accrual. You just have to be prepared to record keep it. So in your case, you know, talk to Ovation, find out how they're handling that on the accrual on the system. Make sure that the paycheck stubs are going to be compliant and are going to actually show the employees how much time they have in their sick bank, if you will. Okay, good. Um, one is uh, works for a retail company, and they have employees basically in all 50 states. Um, they're basically going to follow the San Francisco law, and he just wants to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, it may not um, be compliant with other states. Yeah, okay. you're going to have to check. I mean, for example, New Jersey, their minimum, their grant is 40 hours. It's not 24 hours, so they actually have a higher standard than California does. Um, so there's different laws out there. Um, if anybody has a situation where you have people in all different states, shoot me an email because I can go onto the SHRM website and print out the sick pay for all the different states. Please don't everybody just email me for that, but if somebody has um, people in all different states, I can point you in the right direction or I can print out at least what they have as, as up-to-date as possible for you. Okay, good. That's nice. Thanks, Linda. Um, Maria's wondering, where can we get a poster? There's the a link, link is on one the of slide. the slides. Yeah, it's it's on um, it's on the DLC website, and you can go there, and they have a link to it. If people purchase their um, 2015 posters through you know some online service, <coughs> double check because most of the ones I saw had already included it. Okay, it's because this law, you know, this law was passed last year, so everybody anticipated it. So if you go through Cal Chamber, you go through a service like that, it's already there. If not, though, then go through um, and just click on the link there. Or if you just Google, um, you know, AB1522 or California Sick Pay Poster, it'll direct you right there. But we provided the link to you. Um, one other thing when we're on the mention of posters, because I see this all the time when I audit companies, make sure you have your IWC poster up as well. The one thing that is not included in any of those there are industry-specific posters, so your IWC order has to be posted as well. I'll just throw that out there. Okay, good. Um, Cindy has a question, just to confirm. You know, she's saying basically that if she does the 24 on day 90 and 24 on January 1, the employee does not need 48 hours as a max accrual balance. If you're doing a lump sum grant, you have to do the lump sum on day one. You can prohibit them from using it for 90 days. Okay. Again, you know this is going forward, not for your current employees that have already satisfied that requirement. So you would grant 24 hours. You know, let's say July 1st, you could wipe it out and then put everybody on an, a Jan 1 basis if that's what you want to do. Okay. If you're talking about accrual, this is one of the reasons we're saying avoid accrual if you can. You have to allow them to continue to accrue up to a max and roll over up to a max of six days or 48 hours. The problem is you can restrict the usage to three days or 24 hours. So let's think about this for a second from a practical standpoint. The legislature did not. So Julie's my employee. I put her on um, an accrual system. I have to allow her to continue to accrue, continue to accrue. At some point, it's going to be like eight eight plus days because if you're working full time, that's the accrual. I have to give that to you on a paycheck stub or other written notification that says this is how much time you have available. But then I have to turn around and tell you, oh, but you can only use 24 hours of it, Julie, so sorry, right? Then as the year comes, I have to allow you to roll over up to 48 hours or six days. Again, but then I'm going to turn around and tell you, oh, but you're only going to be able to use 24 hours or three days. It is so messed up on the accrual side, in my opinion, and that's why we're going to just keep saying it. If the person's going to work more than 720 hours for you this year, just do the lump sum grant and be done with it and avoid all of those headaches. That's my best okay. advice. Okay, good. Um, good. Listen, we have one time, oh, time for one more question from Toby. All our employees were granted 24 hours of sick leave on January 1, 2015, as per their existing policy. Do we have to add hours to anyone who has fallen under 24 hours as of July 1st, or do we get credit for what we granted prior to July 1st? 
you are good to go. No need to give okay. them additional time because you've already done more than what the law requires. Okay. All right. Um, that is all the time we have for questions, and I'm sorry because we have quite a few left here. Um, suggestions, of course, to uh, email Linda or Marla. Their email addresses are actually in the presentation, and they're right here on the screen right now. So feel free to give them a call or email them is probably a better way to do it. Um, so that, you know, like I said, I know these questions, and I'll be sending the questions to uh, Linda and Marla, too. Um, on behalf of Linda Duffy with Ethos Human Capital Solutions and Marla Mara Robinson with Mara Robinson, Jackson, and Clarkson, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, Linda, did Julie? you want to kind of yeah. talk? I do. I want to talk about our next webinar. Thank you. I, I thought you were figured you did. And everything. No, I would <laughs> never do that. Yeah, so <laughs> next, next month I'm actually excited. We're going to... Um, we're going to have a guest speaker, which is our recruiting manager, uh, Kimberly Kenner. She's going to be on here, and we're going to be talking about um, some interviewing techniques, sort of our push to recruiting. Um, that's about half our business, actually, so we've gotten good at it over the years. Um, so we're going to talk about behavioral interview questions for the most part, but some of the things you can do to really get your hiring under control. Marla's also going to go through what your managers need to know in terms of acceptable and unacceptable questions, and how to handle some of the odd things that show up. So. You know, a woman walks into your office and you get a job and she's clearly pregnant. What can you ask her? What can you not ask her? Somebody walks in with a disability. What can you ask them? What can you not ask them? So we have all those types of situations pop up and we want to make sure that you are good to go when it comes to making those exceptional hires. Great. Well, and we look forward to, again, the link for registrations right there was also emailed to anybody requesting uh, handouts and such. So. Look for an email to remind you again to register for that. Again, we appreciate your time today. I know this is a tough one um, just in terms of we've only got a few days here before we have to uh, comply with this. So again, feel free to email Linda or Marla, and we hope to provide you with great webinar and information in the future. Have a great day. Thank you very much for attending. Bye, everybody. Thank you.